everyone, welcome into our channel. Today we're going to talk about the terminology used in the logistics field. Before we go ahead, remember to subscribe to our channel, leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed this video. forward with our topic. Today we talk about terminology and what type of terms are used in the logistics field. So how many times have you heard of ASN, OMS, MOQ, but you don't really know what they stand for, right? So you end up googling them and see, okay, what's the meaning behind those terms? And here we are today discussing about them and, and helping you understand a little bit more. So let's think about the supply chain overall we have communications with the manufacturer but the manufacturer also has communication with other manufacturers or let's say procurement company that procure for them raw materials for example and then we have 3pls we have fulfillment centers warehouses and then we have maybe transportation we have the customer the final customers so there's like quite a journey uh, that each product follows from the time they, let's say, procure the raw materials to the time you actually deliver the full and final product to your final customer. So different terms for different situations, but overall, let's pick some. For example, we have what we call an ASN. ASN stands for Advanced Shipping Notice and it's generally it's something quite common just like a fancy term to use it's like when you're shipping something you still send out information to your customers right same thing when you need something from your manufacturer you will tell them in advance what you need same story the other way around your manufacturer is going to tell you it's going to give you an advanced shipping notice where saying that okay those goods are going to move out from our manufacturer from the factory to the warehouse and that's that there's going to be an advanced shipping notice so that you have the time to schedule and connect with the warehouse or even with the, you know with other parties within the supply chain the advanced shipping notice is to let everyone know i mean the interested party know that a shipment is coming is going out and it should be delivered somewhere and generally an asn has to have at least an eta ETA stands for estimated time of arrival. Then we have an advanced material request, AMR, which basically is just like a notice that you want to order more maybe packaging or retail boxes before the production or before something happens, you know? So generally AMR, it stands for advanced material request. Then we have also terminologies like agent. What's an agent? It can be a custom uh, broker, for example. It can be a dropshipper agent. Generally, it's someone in between, someone that, let's say, acts in your behalf and that helps you solve a problem or handle a certain topic or a certain problem. Then we have what we call air cargo. It's basically, those are basically goods that are shipped via air. So it's air cargo or freight freight equal cargo equal product goods so the freight is generally the goods that you move the cargo is generally the goods that you move so container cargo or um, air cargo it means that the cargo is going to go on a plane and it's shipped on a plane that generally handles only products not passengers then we have air carriers so carriers that just use let's say air as a way of transportation so a plane you have the a way bill awb is generally a way bill equals shipping label basically when you're shipping with uh, uh, let's say um with, with a forwarder that uses an air freight mode which means shipping with using a plane by using a plane but then we have the beetle lading this is basically the same thing as an airway bill still a shipping label you have the destination the address what's inside the box for example it's just that it's called bill of lading because it's associated to the ocean freight of course there are other reasons but you can think about airway bill it goes by air bill of lading it goes via ocean and generally airway bill is called awb while um, bill of lading is called bol 
Then we talk about acceptable quality level, AQL or actual time of departure, ATD, ETA, estimated time of arrival. Then we can talk about containers. Containers are generally like a box 40 feet long that is used to ship via ocean your goods. So I'm sure you pretty much saw at least once in your lifetime a container. Then we have what we call bottlenecks or buffers or constraints. A bottleneck is generally, let's say, a part of a process, for example, that doesn't allow you to have a full output compared to other, let's say, um, parts of the processes. For example, you're baking cookies. So baking cookies, your bottleneck can be the oven, for example, because you can bake as many as you want, you have 10 people baking and preparing, but if you only have one oven, then it's gonna take a long time to bake your, your, your biscuits, for example. No matter how many people you have, the bottleneck is still the oven, you will need 10 ovens to go faster, right? So that's the definition of bottleneck. And then we have constraints. Constraints can be the constraint is that we can't have more than two ovens, for example. So uh, a constraint is like a limitation of, 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 let's say, requirements of goods or products or processes, anything that is a limitation. And then we have what we call benchmark, for example. And the benchmark, when someone talks about a benchmark, is generally le the level of service, for example, or um, of all other players, let's say best players in the industry, they set a benchmark, let's say an average, where you should you know, look at when you try to compete with them. And then you have a buffer. We have safety stocks, for example. A buffer is basically, let's say, you know, it's, it's literally determines itself. You add some more units of products, for example, you add a buffer in case you're gonna run out of stock. Let's add a buffer, let's add some more, let's consider some more of, of, of goods or let's consider some buffer of time, some more time so we avoid problems and that can be seen also as a safety stock which means that every time you buy a product or you buy a packaging you should always consider safety stocks which means that in case your forecast is correct for example and you sell 10,000 units and your forecast was 10,000 units, you need 10,000 boxes. However, what if your forecast is a little bit below what you're going to receive or you're going to use? And then you need a buffer, you need a safety stock for packaging, for example, to make sure that if you forecasted for 10,000 or because last month you sold 10,000 units, then you uh, have a buffer, you have some additional stocks of packaging that you can use in case you raise, you know, the uh, the the level and the, the, the amount of orders that you ship and the packaging that you need. Then we talk about packing lists. So a packing list is basically a summary. It's like a document that contains the summary of the shipment. It's how the, 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 the shipment has been packed, so packing list. So we have three boxes that contain 10 units each of this product, red, yellow and blue for example. And then we have the dimensions of the products and how many cartons per how many products, the gross weight, net weight and so on. So we have an idea of what's inside as well. And what, let's say that, that that document gives to the courier an idea in advance of how much space they need to reserve for you for that shipment. And then we talk about the shipping label we said, which can be airway bill, bill of lading, it depends. And then we have the commercial invoice, which is basically a declaration. It's like an, an invoice, but where you have to state a little bit more information. Then you have also a video, we'll link it here. Uh, you have a video where basically we talk about um, the different documents. So a commercial invoice contains your address, the clear value, the weight, the description, custom descriptions, and so on. Then we talk about uh, CIA, cash in advance. We talk about COD, cash on delivery. We talk about POD, proof of delivery, which means that once a courier gets, goes to deliver, most likely it's not gonna happen with the postal services, but have you ever seen or noticed that when someone delivers to your house, from an express courier especially, they ask you to sign? That's basically the proof of delivery. So in case something's happened, I can still request proof of delivery and see who signed it. That's a proof of delivery and COD, it's cash on delivery, which means that you purchase online, but you pay once you get the product. And then we have the consignment and then we have the consignee. So the consignment is basically 
the cargo, the parcel, the order is basically the product that gets shipped and delivered to someone, which is the end consignee. And the consignee, he is the guy basically that ordered the product. If I order online and I'm expecting to receive a camera, I'm the consignee and the camera is the consignment. Then we talk about volumetric weight, actual weight and chargeable weight. So the volumetric weight, we said already in a former video, it's basically given by the dimensions of the box. And then we also have what we call actual weight, which is the weight of the product as soon as you take it and you put it on a weight scale, and that's the actual weight. But then chargeable weight, it's basically the weight you're gonna be charged for, which can be either whichever is higher between volumetric weight and actual weight, or actual weight or volumetric weight. So chargeable weight is the weight you're actually being charged for, which can be, for example, the volumetric weight or the actual weight. Then we talk about SKUs. The SKU is a stock keeping unit and it's generally different from a barcode. So the barcode identifies your product. It's like this barcode, 12345, is for a product that has, for example, a woman t-shirt blue, S size which is a different barcode and also a different SKU if it's another color or if it's another, let's say, size. And this means that generally uh, many people have a different SKU. They use the SKU name to remember uh, what the product is about. For example, T-shirt S or T-shirt M or blue T-shirt M. I don't know, something like that. And then the barcode is actually different, like numeric, for example. But sometimes they also match. The SKU is basically the barcode already, or they use the SKU to make the barcode. And generally the barcode identifies the product, as I said. And if you buy anything in a supermarket and you turn the back of the product, for example, you buy a box of candies, you're gonna see there's always a barcode because that, that gives you the correct inventory, let's say, the correct inventory is going to be uh, useful for inventory management where you every time scan a barcode, you know, when you are at the cashier and you pay for something, they're going to scan the barcode. So the inventory from the store, the market, the supermarket you went to buy goods from is going to get deducted and at the same time they know what they're selling to you and the price associated to it and that's the use of the barcode. Then we talk about shrinkage, for example. And the shrinkage is generally an allowance that you have that a warehouse or 3PL has when, um, let's say, they store your goods. They should be always, they should always have, they always have a shrinkage allowance, which means that, for example, it can be 10%. They have the allowance, they're allowed to, not allowed, but they can lose 10% of your inventory, for example, and not have to pay to you because they handle a lot of stocks in and out and they take a lot of responsibility on your behalf. So this should always be a shrinkage allowance, let's say an error, a margin of error that they can have so they don't have to pay you every single unit in case they lose it. Then we have what we call tariffs. And tariffs have generally duties basically on HS codes, which are harmonized codes. And the harmonized code is basically a code, an international code, used to identify your product and assign a tariff, which means a duty. For example, if you have a t-shirt, a cotton t-shirt, it's gonna be a different tariff, so a different duty, because the HS code, the code that identifies the type of shirt, it's cotton, it's for cotton, not for wool, for example, or silk. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video and you want to know more, then make sure you subscribe to the channel so you get the notification once the part two of the video is out. Thanks again and see you in the next one.